We're recording. Let's six F and D seven. Everybody. Seven's nice. It's a, it's an intimate, intimate Cora. I think we'll roll up, Chris. And Maureen, when you are ready to take over to do the intro. All right. Would you like me to start? I'm good. Yeah, we're up to 14 attendees. Is that what you expect, roughly? Uh, I think there might be a few more that might still join. So do you want me to wait another minute? Sure. All right. We'll wait another minute. Then. Maybe the other presentation is still going on. Um. All right, let's start the uh, the presentation. So with us, we have Daniel and Chris from MDA the uh, first ever Canadian national sponsor for the Canadian for the Canada Space Apps um, Hackathon and they're going to be presenting Canada M3 Autonomous Robotics in Lunar Orbit, a 30-minute presentation followed by a Q&A moderated by Daniel. Um, Chris Lingley is a staff engineer in the guidance, navigation and control department of McDonald and Filler and Associate or MDA in Brampton, Ontario. He has seven years of experience working on research and development of autonomous systems. He was a technical lead for the autonomous systems, the system of autonomous planning and intelligent execution technology, or sapient RD program, which developed a proof of concept architecture for autonomous robotic operations in deep, deep space where communication latency and availability, availability prevent the traditional method of ground control used for Canada number two and that's from being applied. Currently, he is engaged in systems engineering for the next generation of Canadian space manipulators, Canon 3, which will reside on the Gateway Station in lunar orbit. Dr. Ling Lee holds a PhD from the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies and is a professional engineer. So Dr. Ling Lee will talk to us about how do you maintain a space station with no one on board, especially when you can only communicate with it once a week. Okay, thank you very much, Maureen. Um, and thank you all to the uh, attendees from NASA Space Apps. I hope this is gonna be a uh, fun and exciting weekend for you. Um, so, oh, let me, there we go. So, um, as Maureen mentioned, uh, with me is Daniel Shulton, who's the director of Launchpad, uh, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation. Um, the introduction is almost over. Uh, then 30 minute presentation, then probably 25 to 30 minutes of uh, Q&A as long as you uh, keep them coming. So you'll notice uh, that there's a specific Q&A function uh, for this Zoom webinar. Uh, it's probably best to post your questions there rather than in the chat. It'll help Daniel uh, when we get to the end. Um, so I'm assuming I'm uh, addressing a uh, large crowd of space enthusiasts whom I can't see right now. So I'm just going to imagine you're all smiling and nodding. Um, as you know, we have this thing called Earth and around it is something called the International Space Station, very, very close in low Earth orbit. Uh, we also have something orbiting us called the moon, uh, a lot further out. Um, and for those of you who haven't studied uh, 
celestial mechanics, um, there are key points in um, the, the gravity field that are formed by, by two bodies where you get special equilibrium. So you can, these are called Lagrange points. You can imagine them as points that as the moon rotates around the earth, those points rotate with, with respect or rotate as well. So it's like from the point of view of the earth and the moon, they never change. Um, and because of those interesting equilibria in gravity, uh, you can get all of these uh, interesting families of orbits around the moon. And uh, one of those orbits called the uh, near rectilinear halo orbit is going to be the home of our next international space station. And that is shown here in the artist concept. Uh, this is the gateway. And uh, gateway is planning to be built by the same set of international partners who did the ISS. So uh, NASA, ESA, Roscosmos, uh, JAXA, and CSA. Now Gateway is going to be a much smaller station uh, than the ISS, as you can see in the image here. Um, a large part of that has to do with uh, mass and the cost that it takes to send modules out to lunar orbit. And it also has to do with the kinds of missions that um, Gateway will support versus ISS. Um, so one thing you'll see here, uh, this stack of modules off to the side here is not a permanent part of the Gateway Station. This is actually a human lander system. So the idea would be Gateway's floating out there. You're going to send a uh, sorting mission to the South Pole of the Moon. So why not pre-position your assets uh, before the crew arrive. So you could have all of uh, your, your descent, uh, your transfer vehicle, your descent vehicle, and your ascent vehicle all arrived, uh, checked out at Gateway before you send the Orion spacecraft um, with your astronauts. Um, another interesting mission that Gateway can support would be a lunar sample return. So you could send a rover, um, have it go out and collect um, samples of interest, put those on an ascent vehicle, um, have the ascent vehicle come up and rendezvous with Gateway, and then when the astronauts arrive, they just grab the samples, put them in the trunk, and, and back you go. So there's a lot of flexibility that uh, Gateway can provide for um, the Artemis uh, program of missions. Uh, but what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is uh, this little system off to the side called Canadarm3. And Canadarm3 is actually a little bit of a uh, misnomer because when you hear that, you think one arm, Canadarm, right? Uh, it's actually multiple arms, uh, the tools and the interfaces that all work together as a system in order to maintain the gateway. So here's a video. Um, I hope you can hear me as well as see the video. Um, the green box is let's say a battery pack or some electronics or something that needs to uh, be replaced on the outside of the station. So as you'll see here, there is a small arm which can operate independently. And there is a large arm for moving uh, large distances across the, the surface. And that thing that it just picked up is called the tool and on-orbit replaceable unit carrier. Um, or the talk AOC. So we can pick that up and it can move it around the outside. It can actually stand on it, which is not shown in this video, and use it as a base and walk around. Um, as you can see, the arm is double-ended, so either end of the arm uh, can be the base or the end effector. And the small arm can attach to the big arm and get maneuvered around. So the red box is, uh, let's say, something that failed to work. And so that's what we need to replace right now. So we use the small arm to grab it, um, stick it on the talk, um, grab the new box, and insert it. And these, uh, one of the key things about this is that the standardized robotic interfaces, which makes it very easy for the robot to do its job and um, move these assets 
around the outside of the stick. So there's a lot of very, very interesting um, mechanical and electrical uh, challenges that are involved in going from low Earth orbit to uh, the lunar orbit. And there's a lot of very cool innovations that are being planned for CanadaArm3. Um, shown here is the self-repair function. So let's say you had a problem with the large arm's wrist. You could use the small arm to pop that whole wrist cluster off stick it on a slide table on the airlock for the gateway, slide that whole wrist cluster inside the interior of the spacecraft, and then the crew in their shirt sleeve environment can get their screwdrivers and everything, open it up, pull out the circuit card that's broken, put a new one in, screw it all up, send it back outside, and the robotics will then pick it up and, uh, and made it back on. So that's, that's something that uh, I think is incredibly cool. Um, but given that the uh, audience we have today are people who are very, very interested in data and very interested in coding, I'm going to spend uh, the majority of this talk um, talking about how information is managed and decisions are made, and particularly with respect to autonomy. So if we look at the, the history of the Canada arms, there's actually a, a story to be told about how the capabilities have increased over time. So for the first Canada arm, uh, which was on the shuttle, we had um, expert trained uh, astronauts in the shuttle mid deck, looking at the window, controlling this thing with joysticks. So the story there was, was really one of physics and of safety. So how long can the arm be? How big of a module can it, or a satellite, can it manipulate and launch from the back of the, uh, back of the shuttle? Um, how can it ca do free flyer capture, capture something, capture a satellite that you have rendezvoused with? Um, how light can it be and still be stiff enough to be able to maneuver properly? And also safety. Uh, this was used as a cherry picker to maneuver astronauts around, as you can see in the picture on the left. So um, how do we know that it's not going to um, puncture a hole in the side of the shuttle? How do we know it's not going to smack the astronaut against some part of the shuttle? How do we know that if it fails, the astronaut can still shimmy back down the length of the arm and get back to safety? So that was really the story with uh, the first Canada arm. For Canadarm2 and Dexter on the ISS, um, the story changed. Physics was obviously still very important, but now we had to consider things like the sense of touch. So to be able to do those um, peg and hole type insertions as we're um, taking electronics boxes and other repairable units um, on and off the exterior of the station. Um, the self relocation function. Right? Canada Arm 1 was, was a fixed base. Canada Arm 2 was now able to walk end over end around the station. So that was a whole new challenge that needed to be solved. And ground control was very important. Uh, we didn't want to keep taking up the crew time because their time is so precious. Um, if we can control everything from the ground, that's immensely valuable. And I'm happy to say that um, there's only two things that crews still use uh, the arm to do, which is to capture free flyers like the SpaceX Dragon, um, and to maneuver other astronauts who are um, doing EVAs. Um, everything else is controlled from the ground. And in fact, Dexter has never been touched by the crew. It has been 100% controlled from the ground. So that's another question of safety. How do you do that in such a way that if you accidentally had a calm loss between the station and the ground, the robot wouldn't be left doing something unsafe? So a lot of work went into, uh, into that. So now the story for Canada Arm 3, it's got to do everything that its predecessors did, um, but it needs to do more. Um, I mentioned the standardized robotic interfaces, which will um, help it to do its job more smoothly. Um, but the real thing that I, I want to focus on is uh, the autonomy. Um, this arm, much more so than any of its predecessors, will have to 
essentially think for itself. And I'll get into why that is um, in a couple of slides. So uh, about a year and a half ago, our Prime Minister made an announcement from CSA headquarters in St. Hubert, um, committing Canada to providing the Canada Arm 3 for the Gateway program. And in his speech, uh, he used uh, AI and autonomy and artificial intelligence uh, quite liberally. And if you look at some of the um, publications from the government, you'll find this phrase, AI-enabled robotics. So this is a, a very serious um, uh, technology area that Canada is investing in. There's a whole AI ecosystem and um, federal program for growing AI in Canada. And Canada Arm 3 is seen very much as a part of that ecosystem. So, uh, and again, assuming I'm addressing a, a room full of computer scientists, um, chances are you feel like me that um, AI is one of the worst acronyms ever invented. Um, so in this case, what do we consider AI to be? Uh, from our perspective, we take an inclusive definition. So anything that a computer does, which looks like it's a function that you'd normally attribute to the human mind. In other words, anytime it does something smart, anytime it does something intelligent, we're going to call that AI. Now, the reason we do this, there's actually several of them. Um, first, uh, by taking an inclusive definition, we're not presupposing a solution. So for example, if you equate AI with deep learning, then you're always going to be looking for a deep learning solution, even if that's not the right solution to the particular problem that you're looking at. Second, it, in, it uh, combats the AI effect. And this is where as soon as a problem has been solved in computer science, which we used to consider that problem AI, now that it's been solved, people say, oh, well, that's just a search engine or, oh, well, that's just a statistical analysis and they no longer consider it AI. We'd like to fight against that. And finally, um, and this is from a, a practical and communications perspective, it helps to differentiate Canada Arm 3 from its predecessors because this is one of the, the, the key differences, like I mentioned, uh, in the increase in capability of Canadian space robotics. So I alluded before that um, there is a reason why we're talking so much about AI and why we're talking so much about autonomy. This isn't just doing technology for technology's sake. Um, so uh, it, as part of its mission, uh, Gateway is intended to be crewed for only one month out of the year. You send a sortie of astronauts, they descend to the lunar surface or they do whatever it is they're doing and they leave. And for the other 11 months, there is no one on board. This thing is floating out there uh, by itself. No ends. Um, the second is we have very limited uh, data bandwidth to the ground. So ISS is using the, the Teeter's constellations of satellites. We have almost um, constant communication to get down video and data. Um, Gateway is intended to use the deep space network, uh, which is what's used to talk to all of the other deep space probes in the, the solar system. And since it has to go uh, communicate that much further, um, you end up with less, less data bandwidth. So, uh, even if we wanted to, we couldn't get all the data that this robot generates back to the ground to look at it. Um, the next point is the availability of that communication infrastructure. Like I mentioned, um, DS DSN is going to need to break off communications with Gateway to talk to uh, various, various other things around the solar system. So it can't be uh, one hundred percent committed to gateway. Um, so the plan while crew is there is they will be mostly talking to gateway. Um, but when there's no one on board, the idea is let's free up that infrastructure. So we could be looking at up to a week long loss of signal. So not only is it out there with no one on board, uh, we don't have eyes on it for an entire week. But 
um, it still has to get its job done. And in fact, when we do talk to it, um, we may have as little as a single eight hour comlink per week. So this is really pushing for a more Mars-like philosophy. Um, we almost have to think of the Canada Arm 3 like a rover where you log in, you send up a script, you get some data back, and then you, you, know, you, should, you hang up the phone and dial back in a week later and, and see how things went. So to really understand the, uh, the implication and the change that we have to go through um, in developing Canada Arm 3, you need to start by understanding how it is we control uh, things today. The images here are taken from the uh, robotics control rooms that are located at CSA headquarters in, in Saint-Hubert. And on the left, we have the robotics officer who's on console, who is uh, commanding Canada Arm 2 and Dexter. And as you can see, she has a lot of um, video being downlinked and shown to her. She has about eight screens in front of her. Most of them are displaying uh, alphanumeric data that she has to monitor. Um, she can be listening to maybe up to as many as eight voice loops in her ear at one time, one of them possibly in Russian. Um, so there's a, there's a tremendous uh, cognitive load involved in this. And on the right, you can see that in the sort of the the back control room, we have another team of experts who also have tons of monitors that they're watching and monitoring and sort of checking over the shoulder. They can't send any commands, but they can be watching essentially over the shoulder of the robo to make sure that everything's going okay. And um, the way commands are sent are is individual. You have a procedure in front of you. Um, before you send every command, you must check some telemetry to see that it's correct. You send your command, you send it with a ready arm fire protocol. So, you know, queue it up, arm it, and then say, okay, go. And then the robot does its job. You monitor it as it's working. And when it's done, you check a whole bunch of other telemetry to make sure you're still on track. So this is a very effective and very safe way of controlling the robots. Um, Canada Arm 2 has been on orbit for almost 20 years now. And uh, Dexter is, I think, at 12. Um, so this has been very successful. But as I'm sure you've realized, this is all predicated on having nearly constant communication with the spacecraft. And so for the reasons I just talked about on the next slide, this whole paradigm has to change if we're going to operate for um, with week-long blackouts and single eight-hour comm windows. So the concept that we have in mind for what the ground station is going to look like for Canada Arm 3 is shown here. Now, there's an awful lot going on time and uh, see through it. Um, so let's say it's been working for a week. Uh, we haven't had eyes on it. We get acquisition of signal and all of a sudden, all this data comes down. We haven't been going step by step with situation awareness like we have before. So everything arrives. And how do we get all of that information into a proper mental model that the operators can understand? And so they know what the situation is there. So one concept is to have uh, an augmented reality um, table, which can show both spatial information as well as state information for different parts. Um, maybe this particular thing has failed, and so this operator is going to click on it. It brings up a virtual screen where they see what's gone wrong and what they need to do. Um, he then uh, gets an idea in his head for what he wants the, the robot to do. So again, it's a matter of human factors. How quickly can he get that intent into the system. So can he use his hands and grab, an, a, grab a replacement unit and drag it and drop it into the right spot? And that becomes the goal. That goal comes over here to an automated mission planning system, 
which then says, okay, well, in order to do that, based on what I know about the world, I'm going to need to pull this out, put it over here, drew it over here, take this, put it in the talk, move it over, move the talk over here, take this, grab the small arm, grab it, and then stick the new thing in and let go. Um, that all will happen automatically um, or get planned automatically. You can come back to the AR world so that everyone here can watch the rehearsal, make sure they like it. If they don't, they can say pause it and you know, maybe go in and change some of the arm configurations. Um, they can be working collaboratively with someone who is uh, attending remotely, uh, this person, Alex from NASA. And Alex can be saying, well, have you thought about this and this? And so that you get um, a quick buy-in from the other stakeholders um, who are uh, taking advantage of the robotics. So then when you're happy, you now have your new plan, which you can then upload and you can say goodnight. And over the next week, the robot will execute that plan autonomously and the cycle repeats. So uh, what are examples of what we consider AI enabled functions? Well, I just talked about the mission planning, uh, which is automated. Um, part of that, every time you have an action in your plan, which says move the robot from A to B, something's got to plan that trajectory so that you don't actually accidentally hit something. Um, I mentioned we can't get all the data back even if we wanted to, but some of that data is going to be very useful. If we had an anomaly on orbit, uh, we'd want to see that. Um, and we also want to uh, keep track of how the mechanisms are performing. So let's say as a joint get old, gets old, it may start pulling more and more current in order to do its job. And we want to know about that so that we can pre-place a replacement joint, joint when the time comes. Um, also, there's plenty of uncertainty in the actual uh, contact of um, manipulating the objects on the outside. You have thermal deformations and pressure deformations on the station. So where your 3D model says your interface is may not be exactly correct. So you need to have the vision system to do your final alignment before you go in and, uh, and grab what you need to touch. And uh, things like worksite safety checks. So right now, um, the um, robotics officers have, have um, on occasion, uh, gotten to a work site, looked at it on the video and said, oh, the last time the astronauts were here, they left something behind, which we weren't expecting. So we need to have the same kind of checks um, for the Canada Arm 3. Um, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'll go through these next few slides rather quickly. Um, again, because I'm I, I know you're interested in, uh, in data and computing. Uh, this is some of the challenges that um, we're looking at with these AI-enabled functions. Um, so one is compute capacity. For the ground, that's not too bad. We can upgrade it whenever we want, get a whole rack of GPUs and stick them in there if we need to. Um, the problem is the flight segment. It's going to launch in 2026 and uh, Everything, all the avionics that are on there will be subject to power budgets. They'll need to be able to survive the radiation environment in lunar orbit. Um, theoretically, we could uh, upgrade the processors that are inside the module, but the avionics that are, it's inside the arm, which is usually where the safety critical functions are, uh, those will all be fixed. So whatever we send up, that's what we have to live with for the next 15 years. Um, and we want to be able to remain flexible and evolvable. Um, software upgrades have been very, very useful for Canada Arm 2 and Dexter. I th think uh, somebody could correct me if I was wrong, if they could actually talk to me. I think we're on uh, version 10.1 of the uh, software for um, the station. So we want to do the same type of thing for Canada Arm 3. Um, verification and validation is also very key. Um, all of our software uh, has to be rigorously tested before it's allowed to fly. And you need to be able to show that you have full coverage of what you're going to see. So for example, if you develop a vision system, uh, you need to show that it's going to work under all the different types of um, solar illumination conditions, the harsh shadows, the bright uh, specular reflections. Um, and uh, particularly if you are developing a machine learning solution, uh, you really have to be careful um, that you have a deterministic outcomes. So for example, you can't set up a reinforcement learning algorithm in the flight segment 
which is going to learn and adapt itself over time because you don't know in what direction that adaptation is going to go. So it's going to be unsafe or going to be considered unsafe. Um, also, the amount of data that you have access to to train your deep learning solution is key. Um, we have millions of cat pictures on the internet, but we've mainly only, maybe only a few dozen times had a free flight capture of a, a spacecraft visiting the, the station. So that's not a lot of data points. Uh, we also have a reality gap. Um, there are certain things that you just can't test here on the ground uh, and have them and be confident that the distribution of the data you have on the ground is going to match the distribution of data that you see when you're actually in flight in zero G and in the harsh solar lighting conditions. Uh, so that's a concern. And finally, uh, safety. Um, even though crew aren't going to be on board for 11 months, it's still a crew rated vehicle. So you have to hit all of your um, safety requirements. And these are a conservative group of stakeholders. Astronaut lives are on the line and, and nobody messes with that. Um, and particularly, the new autonomy functions are going to be uh, intensely scrutinized. And the more capability you add, those are more potential failure points. Um, so anything that you are doing intelligently, uh, it has to fail safe. You have to know when it's doing a good job and when it's kind of sketchy and you shouldn't trust it. But it also shouldn't uh, have false alarms. It shouldn't be saying, oh, don't trust me, don't trust me all the time because then you'll never get anything done during your, uh, during your week without conflict to the ground. Um, so that is uh, essentially the wrap up of my talk. Um, if you are interested in Canada Arm 3, um, please uh, do what you can to get involved. Um, if you're a student uh, who's graduating, uh, please consider coming to work for us. Um, we're starting to hire a little bit now, but as this program takes off, we are going to need a much uh, larger workforce. Um, and if you are already employed and your company does something interesting that you think could uh, be valuable, then please, by all means, uh, reach out to Launchpad. Launchpad is run by Daniel, who we are fortunate to have on the line here. So he will connect you to whatever part of the corporation um, that's a win-win for uh, the, the two organizations to work together. Um, so uh, thank you very much for your attention, which I'm assuming you've been giving me. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Again, please remember to use the, the Q&A feature. All right, thank you, Chris. That's excellent. And I hope uh, people enjoyed that. Um, so we, we got to two questions in so far, so the, oh, three, so please keep them coming because this is the fun part of it where I get to ask questions to Chris and he has to do the hard work of answering them. So please use the Q&A function, it makes it a little easier for me. We'll start one that came through the chat. Reality gap, like, like using clowns to model floating objects. So this is more of a comment, not a question. Like using clones? Clowns. Clowns. To molding, to model mm. molding objects. We have to think about that one, Chris. Yes. I think I, I, think I know who sent that. And um, This is from Aaron. 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 Ah, Aaron, I'll deal with you later. There you go. <laughs> Okay, um, first question is, what is the job title of those people who work in front of the eight screens? Yes, um, they would be the uh, robotics officers or robos. Um, there's kind of three flavors of robos. Um, there are the uh, uh, task robos who um, put together the procedures um, so they will be given a goal and say, okay, something is broken, we have to replace it. And their job is to figure out all the different steps that are required to interface with the payload providers or whoever is necessary to get that other information that's needed, um, come up with a procedure, make sure it gets validated by all the proper stakeholders. Uh, who needs to know 
uh, in very, very fine detail uh, how everything works on the, uh, on the robot. Um, because if you get an anomaly, let's say you get some, you know, you give it a command and you get some error message back, you're, you're sitting there live on console. You need to be able to figure out uh, what could possibly have given you that error and what steps you can take in order to clear that fault and be able to proceed um, with, your, um, with your task that you're trying to do. And then there's kind of the, the, the head robo who's making sure that um, you know, the procedure's following, that's doing the, the double check. Um, something I didn't mention is that um, it's not just one person sending up commands. You have to have a pair of eyes on it to make sure that you have queued up the correct command so that you don't accidentally um, send something up and have an operator. I lost the connection there. Okay, next question. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, you're back. That's Did probably my computer that is struggling. Okay. AI has been considered in the operation of the arm. Has it been considered in the design of the arm, hardware or software? Ooh, that mm -hmm. is an interesting question. Um, I suppose the short answer is no. Um, but there are tools that can be used, which again, if we go back to the inclusive definition, of AI that, that could be considered. So for example, when you're doing um, model-based systems engineering, um, you can define uh, the different behaviors that um, the robot needs to do. You can define um, uh, things that are called assume guarantee contracts. So um, you say, um, if you give this robot a command, and all of the inputs obey uh, these particular constraints, then I guarantee you that the output of this command that the robot does is going to uh, meet these other set of conditions. And you can do that, set that up for everything that the robot can do. And then using formal logic, you can then prove that um, as long as a particular set of inputs at a system level is correct, that the whole behavior that you get at the out outcome is also correct. So because that seems to me at least to be the intelligent fun, um, I would call that AI. Great. Um, how will the virtual reality aspect of the ground be? Will it be a software that we develop? Um, well, uh, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't reinvent the wheel, right? So something like Unity, we wouldn't redo that from scratch. We'd take advantage of that. Um, the hardware uh, that we'd use to interface, unless we had really compelling reasons uh, why a commercial product wouldn't do the job, again, we would just reuse that. That's why in the picture you saw a bunch of Microsoft HoloLenses. They didn't pay us for that, by the way. That was just what we used. Um, but obviously components of that software are going to need to be uh, generated by us. So uh, to go from the, uh, the metaphors that the operator is using. So for example, um, when they grab a, uh, an electronics box, what does that mean semantically to the station? Well, that means that something has just been detached and you know that you can only uh, insert it into one of those standardized uh, fixtures. So as you bring it over to the fixture, it could snap in place. And then you could say, okay, well, um, if the operator has, has grabbed something in the virtual world, snapped in into place, well, what does that mean? Well, that could mean this is now goal. So you look at the, um, the uh, semantic description of that goal so logically, what does that mean? That means uh, this interface, which used to be empty, is now full. And this thing, which used to be over here, is now over here. And you can say, okay, well, that defines my goal state. And then you take that goal state, encode it, and send it over to the mission planning software. 
Again, the mission planning software is independent of whatever HMI you're using to talk to it. So while we're getting a lot of the uh, industry standardization, the commercial um, uh, availability of VR and AR hardware, uh, all of the back end stuff and the glue that talks between the two of them, that's going to be things that we need to develop. And I think with that one also, uh, the world will look quite differently in, uh, in five years from now. There will yeah. be all kinds of new technology available. Yeah, I can imagine somebody looking back at that slide and going, HoloLens, ha! Yeah. <laughs> you do that? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's do a few um, uh, job type really questions. Uh, that I, uh, we've got 12 questions already, Chris. Uh, where we have quite, quite a few. Uh, would you have to have some sort of background in aerospace to be able to apply to MBA? Also, do you do co-ops or only full-time jobs? Okay, um, no, you don't need an aerospace degree. Um, we need people with varying skills, um, mechanical, electrical, software, uh, controls, um, PA and QA. Um, I'm sure there's somebody I'm missing. Um, yeah, systems engineering. Um, we need technicians. Um, you, you know, you really need to stop and think when you are creating a cable harness that is going to fly in space for 15 years and is never going to be maintained, you better know how to solder, right? <laughs> um, so we need very, very talented people um, in that area. Um, and of course, we need people in support functions as well, right? We need uh, HR, we need marketing, we need finance, we need uh, governance, we need program managers, we need all kinds of talent. You may even yeah. need business development. Business development. How could I have forgotten? <laughs> uh, and here, another one. Oh, and the, sorry, wait, there was a second part, which was uh, co-ops. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so we do... Uh, we do uh, take four month uh, co-ops from university as well as 12 and 16 month uh, co-ops if you're doing a professional experience here. Um, typically those tend to be on the, uh, the upper years of undergraduate, um, but I can imagine that as this program gets bigger and bigger um, and we need more and more people, that's probably going to start moving into the younger years as well. Okay. Uh, what are the opportunities available for mechanical engineers specializing in fluid mechanics and, and thermal science with a PhD? Aha! Thermal is incredibly important. I, if you're asking this question, I don't need to convince you that thermal is important because you already know. Um, but for, for people who don't normally think about things in space, right? Think about um, the fan on your computer, um, which is cooling your GPU and allowing you to do all this processing. Uh, and now put that in a vacuum. Now your fan is absolutely useless. How are you going to dissipate the heat that that single card is, is generating, right? Um, thermal, is, uh, thermal is so important. Uh, thermal effects, um, things like the vision system, right? If you, let's say you're, you're coming in, you've got a camera on this end of the end effector and there's a target over here and your sun is down here. Now this side of your end effector has expanded. This side where your camera is, is looking at black space. So it's contracting and that actually changes the geometry enough that it can affect the accuracy of your sensing and how well you can align those two interfaces. So yes. Thermal engineers, uh, please, by all means, uh, feel free to apply. Okay. What kind of tools and skills are you looking for in new grads to work in developing robotics for space? What are we looking for in new grads? Um, there, I'm sure there are many, many answers to that question. Uh, obviously, there's the different disciplines, which I mentioned before. Um, obviously, we would like you to have done well in school. Um, 
speaking personally, um, once you have the, the technical stuff down, which every engineer should have, um, the things that are extra advantageous are the ability to reason logically and to come up with a plan or an argument. So, um, and then to be able to communicate that plan or argument effectively. So for example, if you are a junior engineer, you've just joined the company, you've been given an analysis to do, and now you have to report the results of that analysis to a bunch of senior engineers and managers and decision makers. What you don't want to do is get up in front of them and say, hello, my job was to analyze this. So I put it into this tool and here's all the, the list of parameters that I used. And then I hit go and then I got this graph and that graph is the answer. Thank you very much and sit down because that's not going to help anybody make a decision. What you have to say is my job was to figure out if this maneuver was going to be safe. In order to show that the maneuver is going to be safe, I have to show that the um, forces and torques aren't going to be exceeded. And I have to show that if something goes wrong and we slam on the brakes, then nothing gets damaged. So then how do you prove each of those points? Well, I proved this point by doing this analysis. And the evidence that it's okay is this graph with this red line. And you can see that all the black lines are underneath it. Next point, right? And so you break it down, you show it as a proof and in the end, you can say, therefore, thanks to the work I've done, uh, we know that this is safe. A decision maker can see that presentation and not know any of the physics behind it, but can say, okay, I can decide with confidence that we can go ahead with this. Um, I hope that answers your question. Okay, no, that's good. Um, back to uh, more of the technical questions. Um, this is a good one. Um, to what extent are the AI features going to be tested in advance using Canada Arm 2 and Dexter? Ah, excellent question. Wonderful, wonderful question. Um, so, um, anything that, sorry, I should say this, I'm not speaking for the Canada Arm 2 program. I'm speaking at who's thinking, you know, wonderful and fantastic ideas. So nothing I say is legally binding. Um, but I think uh, Kenner 2 and Dexter make a great test bed for proving out some of these technologies. Some things we won't be able to do because they'll just be a physical hardware limitation, right? Um, for the particular cameras and targets that we designed for Canada Arm 3, they might not be compatible with the cameras and targets that are, that are already flown. And there may not be um, the will to, let's say, launch a particular test article in order to do that. But there's a lot we can do with what's already up there. Um, a program that's uh, just uh, in, the, in the process of being commissioned right now is to repurpose uh, one of the computers that was originally uh, launched for the construction of the station. It was called the Artificial Vision Unit, and its job um, was to get the camera feed and there were these black and white targets on the outside of the modules. You can still see them. And uh, knowing where those targets were, it could figure out the pose of modules. So as you were con constructing the station, you could, be, you could make sure everything was, was aligned. Well, station's already constructed. We don't need that function anymore, but we still have a perfectly good flight computer sitting up there. Um, so it has been repurposed now um, as a, essentially as a, a scripting engine, an, an autonomy engine. So the robos now, instead of having to issue command by command, they can actually write a script, send that script up, and then just send the command to, to launch the script. And the script will have, um, insofar as is possible, the ability to check all of the same pieces of telemetry that that robotics officer is looking at on those screens. So their job was to check these seven numbers over here. Well, a computer can do that. So that is taking our first step in moving from uh, very human-centered, uh, labor-intensive commanding toward autonomy. So as that gets commissioned and proved out and people find it safer, 
we can start sending more and more complex scripts. We can create scripts of scripts. So now you can do goal-based commanding. Now you can say, um, uh, bring this particular up to operational on the redundant string. And it'll look at, it, at its current situation and say, okay, well, this is in this state and this is in this state. So I need to figure out, okay, I need to send these sets of commands in this particular order in order to get me to the state that um, the officer has, uh, has commanded. Um, so that's just, that's, that's one example, right? So um, uh, anywhere where we can find um, commonalities like that, where we can use what's already existing to increase the maturity and learn those lessons uh, for, gate, for Gateway is uh, it's going to be very powerful. Good. Um, here's another one from Aaron, so be ready. Oh dear. Um, as the mission planning becomes more, uh, becomes automated like you described, will the need for flight controllers those decrease or change a lot? You'll, you'll always need flight controllers. Um, because there's no replacing the human mind. Um, so the trick is to decrease the demand on them, the demand on their cognition. So rather than having a, a team of folks um, who have split up the cognitive task among them, because there's no way one person can do it, um, some of them, sorry, let me, let me rephrase this. Uh, of all the things that, all the decisions that need to be taken and all the information that needs to be analyzed, allocate the decisions that can be made by a computer to a computer. That way you don't need a human doing the boring bookkeeping type of tasks. You can reserve your human for the really hard problems, the things that require creativity um, and, uh, and intuition and, and higher level problem solving. So in that way, you decrease uh, the number of people that you have to have on console for a particular operation. And that saves you um, a lot of money over the 15 year lifespan of the program. And it actually increases the, the enjoyment or the fun of that job because now you don't have to worry about all the little details. Am I in the right mode for this particular command to get the right state transition, right? Something's already watching that. You just need to take care of the things that are interesting and important to you. Okay, here we have another interesting one. Um, so one of the challenges is creating a new interface or system to construct or manufacture a docking system or a system for construction in space. What do you think the current solution doesn't have or lacks and how CSA or SAT data can help you to create a new solution? What is the most important aspect when creating this new solution on the interfaces? Okay. Um, I'll history. start, sorry? There's a history there as well. Okay, I will start by saying that um, I'm not really a mechanical expert and I don't really know much about constructing things in space. Um, I know a little bit about attaching things that have already been constructed, but making new things while we're in orbit is, I, I can't really address that. What I can say is that um, having standardized interfaces for the robotics is immensely helpful. Um, right now on station, there are a number of uh, different interfaces and occasionally a payload provider will come up with their own interface, which is supposed to be robotically compatible. Um, but every time a new interface comes by, you need to analyze it. You need to make sure that the arm isn't gonna break itself when it's using that interface. You have to make sure it can't inadvertently um, unlatch you have to make sure that the, the force needed to pull something out of a, of a birthing interface, um, again, doesn't exceed the, the low limits of the arm. The tolerances on how well you need to be aligned 
in order to do the, the capture. All of those things need to be analyzed and it's an incredible amount of work. Um, the goal for Gateway is to say, okay, um, here are your standardized interfaces. You have a small, medium, and a large. Whatever size you need for your payload, you pick one, you bolt it on top, the robot's gonna grab here and it's gonna insert here. So no matter what you put over here, this part we understand and we understand it perfectly. And we've designed it so that it has a good um, capture envelope for the end effector. We've designed it so it's got a good insertion envelope for when you're um, inserting it. We've designed it so that the, the targets you have for alignment are machine compatible so that we can get a very reliable uh, vision system uh, relative pose estimate to do that capture. So we, by understanding all of those aspects of the interface, um, it makes it much uh, less effort to analyze when you have a new payload and you have more reliability. You can trust your autonomy more because you can say, well, we have worked the heck out of this. We know that uh, we are going to meet all of our error budgets even with no human watching. Um, so that's really the, um, uh, the liberating factor of, of having these interfaces. Um, before I close off this question, I will let you know that um, one of these interfaces has the most Canadian acronym of all. It's called the Small On-Orbit Replaceable Unit Interface, or SORI. <laughs> so, sorry. All right. Um, we, we got a lot of questions, Chris. Uh, we, we couldn't quite keep up. I, I will have time for one more, and it will be the last one, and then uh, Maureen can take it over. It's not from Aaron, is it? No, it's not. It's okay. Um, what do you think the Canadian space sector will look like in the next decade? Wow. <laughs> wow, Daniel, you saved the big one for last. Yes, I did. Huh. I think the better question is, am I even qualified to answer that question? Yes, you are. Um, wow, what's the Canadian space sector going to look like? You want me, want me to keep, keep a crack on the, give a crack? Actually, I would love for you to give a crack on that, Daniel. Yeah, what we would love to see at MDA as a result of Canada Arm 3, that we create a wide and large and successful ecosystem of space companies, big, small, medium, startups, universities. Uh, we want to make this a real big Canadian program with lots of involvement and lots of opportunities to set uh, new companies and universities and research groups, set them up for future success after Canada Arm 3, either in space for commercial space robotics or for terrestrial applications, which of course is a much bigger market than the galactic market for space robots. So uh, we are working very hard to make that, um, to put the ingredients in there to make that possible. And, and we're looking forward to getting a lots of partners that will get us there. That answer was infinitely better than anything I could have said. All right, Maureen. Uh, we are at uh, at 9.30 here in the, in the Eastern time zone, that is. Um, and I hope it was uh, interesting for everybody. So, over to you. It was great. Thank you so much, Kurt. Thank you so much, Daniel. And thank you so much, everyone who participated and sent questions. Um, I, uh, I hope that we can answer enough of them that you feel satiated in your interest for space, at least for tonight. Uh, and then we will be posting the recording of this uh, workshop fairly shortly as soon as we have it. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you so much for hosting. And thank you so much for, uh, to MDA for being the first official national sponsor for the Canadian Space Apps Challenge. Thank you, Maria. It's been a pleasure. Great. Good night, everybody. Good night.